So this is the problem on page 79. So in this problem, we have three shareholders. A is contributing equipment with 1245 gains. So code section 1245 is basically um, depreciation that has been taken on the equipment. And when it's sold to the extent depreciation has been taken, it produces ordinary income under code section 1245. So that's what that means. Um, <clears throat> They are contributing property with a basis of 15,000, a fair market value of 22, and they are receiving 15 common shares, 100 shares preferred, and $2,000 in cash. B is contributing inventory with a basis of 7,000, a fair market value of 20, land with a basis of 13, and a fair market value of 10, and they are receiving 15 shares of common and $15,000 in cash. C is contributing land with a basis of 20,000 and a fair market value of 50 for 10 common shares, $5,000 in cash, and a $35,000 note from the corporation. So the question, the first question you always ask is, does 351 apply here to the parties in the transaction? <clears throat> well, they're all contributing property, they're all receiving shares, um, <clears throat> And they all own 100% of what's out there according to these facts. So yes, 351 is going to be met. So now we need to talk about the tax consequences to the different shareholders and to the corporation. So let's talk about A first. <clears throat> all right. So how much gain realized does shareholder A have? So her gain realized is going to be 22 minus 15 or $7,000. How much gain recognized does she have? Okay, well it's going to be the lesser of her gain realized of 7,000 or the boot received of $2,000 in cash. Since the lesser of these is $2,000, the $2,000 is going to be the amount of her gain recognized. So what is going to be the basis in her shares? So her total basis, what's, we start with her transferred basis first, right? $15,000, okay? Minus the boot received of $2,000 plus the boot recognized of $2,000 which equals a $15,000 basis. But shareholder A is receiving two different classes of stock. She's receiving common stock and preferred stock. So we have to allocate this $15,000 basis amongst the two different classes of stock. How is this going to be allocated? It's basically going to be done according to relative fair market value. So if you, I didn't write these facts on the board, but it does say on page 79 that the fair market value of her common stock is 15,000 and the fair market value of her preferred stock is $5,000. So I write 5K, 15K. So that means we have total $20,000 of value here. And 15,000 of it is common. So that means 75% basically of her basis, okay, is going to go to wor toward common shares or 11,250. And the same thing for preferred, 5,000 over 20 total value times 15,000 which is going to be equal the difference of 3750 So this shareholder is going to have a basis in the common stock of 11250 and a basis in her preferred stock of $3,750. Um, and then her holding period, um, wait, actually, sorry. So the next topic to discuss is going to be um, page 79, 
she's going to have basically have a tight holding period in both classes of stock here because this is a 1231 property. What about the corporation for A's contribution? So the corporation is going to have a transfer basis of 15000 plus gain recognized by the shareholder, $2,000. So the corporation is going to have a basis in this equipment of $17,000. All right. Everyone have A. I'm going to erase this because I don't have room. And we're going to talk about B. <clears throat> so, B is contributing inventory and land. So, he has two pieces of property. So, the first question that I would, if it was me, I would take a look at. Since he's contributing, you know, these two properties, do we need to worry about Code Section 362E? Because you notice, one of them is a lost property. The land has a basis greater than the fair market value. Well, remember that 362E is done in the aggregate. So we have $20,000 of aggregate basis and $30,000 of aggregate value. So what that means is 362E does not come into the picture here. We don't have to worry about it. What we do need to think about is going to be B's gain realized. Um, which is going to be done, remember, on a property-by-property property basis. So for the inventory, we have gain realized of 20 minus 7, or $13,000. And for the land, we basically have a $3,000 loss. Okay, now what about the boot? Boot received. Remember, we have to allocate boot according to relative fair market value. So there's $30,000 of fair market value here, of total fair market value, okay? 30K total fair market value. How much of that belongs to the inventory? Basically 20 out of 30, or two thirds, times the amount of total boot received, which is $15,000. So that means we are going to have $10,000 of boot attributed to the inventory. What about with the land? 10 over 30 times 15,000 equals $5,000, right? Because the land has $10,000 of value out of, out of 30 total. Now remember, this is done on a property by property basis. So we're going to compare the gain realized for each property with the boot allocation for each property. Since inventory has $13,000 of gain realized and a $10,000 boot allocation, we recognize the lesser of or $10,000. The land has a $3,000 loss and a $5,000 boot allocation, which went since we recognize the lesser of, but basically means zero, right? So there's nothing to recognize here. So B is going to have total gain recognition of $10,000. What's going to be B's basis in his shares? Well, we're going to start with our transfer basis, which is 13 plus 7, $20,000 minus the boot received, which is $15,000 plus the boot recognized, which is 10, which equals $15,000. issue. Because B is contributing two different types of property, both inventory and land, we have the question of what exactly is going to be his holding period in these shares. One of these assets is 
an ordinary income property and one of these assets is going to be a capital gain property. Holding period is also allocated according to relative fair market value. So that means 20 out of 30 of fair market value is going to be not tacked or two thirds and 10 out of 30 is related to capital gain and that'll be tacked. Now what about for the corporation? What are their tax consequences here? So the corporation has two pieces of property that they are receiving, inventory and land. So we're going to start with our transfer basis for inventory. Remember, we can't do it cumulative for the corporation like we can for the shareholder because the corporation has the actual assets. The shareholder just has shares. So now we need to figure out what is going to be the adjustment to the basis for the corporation. There are different ways different arguments to be made for how to allocate it, but the way that I would like you to allocate it in this class and the way that it is most commonly done um, according to uh, basic practice is um, instead of allocating it, hold on, I'm going to read exactly what it says in the answer key. <clears throat> So it says in the answer key that we basically want to allocate the gain according to the asset that created it. So, which makes sense. There, there's different arguments for doing this different ways, but in practice it is most commonly done this way. So since the inventory created a $10,000 gain recognition of boot, the $10,000 adjustment should go to inventory. And since the land was a lost property, there is no gain recognized from the land. So the land is just going to have a straight up carryover basis. Okay. Now let's talk about C. So C is contributing capital gain property with a $20,000 basis and a $50,000 fair market value, which creates a $30,000 gain realized. How much gain recognized are they going to have here? Well, let's look at the boot that they are receiving. They are receiving $5,000 in cash and a $35,000 note from the corporation. So they are basically receiving $40,000 of boot. They have to recognize, there's an asset by asset, but there's only one asset being contributed. So since they have to recognize the lesser of the two, it's going to be $30,000 of gain recognition. Now since part of this is coming from a note, there is of course the question, of do they have to recognize all of this now or are they going to be able to recognize it um, basically over time? And the code or the regs, I should say, say that they can recognize it over time. Um, <clears throat> only part of it is going to have to be recognized now. Which part of it? Basically, they are receiving $40,000 of boot here, okay, but only $30,000 has to be recognized now. I mean, has to be recognized, period, right? So basically, three quarters of the boot, or 30 out of 40, is recognized, period. 
then out of this boot, $5,000 is cash and $35,000 is a note. So that means of the $5,000 cash, basically three quarters of it or $37.50 is going to be recognized now. And then the remainder, which is basically going to be $30,000 minus $37.50, um, which is going to be $26,250, is going to be recognized over time as the court pays. Um, you, the book goes into a very, the answer key goes into a very long description on how this is actually calculated. You are not responsible for knowing that. That's under the rules under code section 453. I don't want you to know that. Um, don't spend time trying to rack your brain over it. It's not hard. It's just slow going to figure it out. And it's really outside of the scope of this class. The, and the, the main thing I want you to know is that they can defer their recognition, and but they are going to get, um, they're going to have an immediate basis adjustment. So we start with our twenty thousand dollars of basis, okay, plus, or I should say, minus the boot received of forty, plus the boot recognized of. 30, which equals a $10,000 basis in the shares. Now, what about the corporate? And this is all going to be taxed because it's all land. What about the corporate basis? Well, the corporation is going to start with the transferred basis plus the gain that is recognized now, which is $37.50. The rest the corporation is not going to be able to take an adjustment for until they actually make payments on the note. <clears throat> okay, that's it for that question. Okay. Now let's talk about liabilities, which actually work pretty closely with boot. So what happens if the shareholder, in addition to contributing property, so let's say we have our corporation X and we have our shareholder A again, and they're contributing land with a basis of $10,000 a fair market value of 20 and it's subject to a mortgage of $5,000 and then they receive shares. And X is going to take subject to this mortgage. That means X is going to take over the mortgage. What happens now? Is this assumption of liability considered to be boot for shareholder A? Well, it's kind of a yes and no answer. So let's take a look at what the code says. This is under code section 357C. All right? Code section 357C. <clears throat> This is under three. Let's look at 357A first. Except as provided in subsections B and C. What does that mean? Uh oh, that means there are going to be exceptions. So I'm actually going to write 357A. The general rules under 357A, and it says the tax if the taxpayer receives property which would be permitted to be received under code section 351 without the recognition of gain and as part of the consideration another party assumes the liability then such assumption shall not be treated as money or other property. <clears throat> 
So what 357A says is liabilities assumed are not boot to the shareholder. I.e. do not create the recognition of gain. But there are two exceptions. <clears throat> One is under 357B, and that is if the sole purpose of the transaction is to, if the purpose of the transaction was to avoid federal income tax or if there was no bona fide business purpose. The next exception is under code section 357C. And it says that if the liabilities are in excess of basis, then the excess is boot or gain recognized. <clears throat> now, remember how I just said, okay, our liabilities assume tree is boot. And I said, yes or no? Yes and no. I say that because one, we have these two exceptions and this one under 357C is a pretty big exception. But I'll also say that because we have some basis rules to consider under, let's see. Code section 358D. So under 358D, what it says is that for purposes of calculating the basis to the shareholder, the liability assumption is treated as boot. So for purposes of the basis calculation, I'll say shareholder basis calculation, The liabilities are boot. So, in our example that we have here, where we have A contributing property with a basis of 10,000, a fair market value of 20, and subject to a mortgage of five. Is, first of all, what's going, um, what's A's, gain realized is going to be $10,000 here. Basis minus fair market value. Um, but does A have any boot that's received under 357A? The answer is no, because the mortgage is less than the basis. But what would be the basis to the shareholder? Well, we're still going to have to consider this mortgage to the shareholder. So here the shareholder would have a basis of $10,000 transfer minus $5,000 mortgage, which is considered to be boot received for purposes of the basis calculation. Now what about if this mortgage were actually $15,000? What now? Well, now what we have is 357C because the liabilities are in excess of basis. So that means that the shareholder is going to have to have, is going to have gain recognition to the extent that the mortgage exceeds the basis or $5,000 basically. And the basis is always going to equal zero for the shareholder but I'll show you why. We start with our transferred basis of 10, minus our boot received, i.e. the mortgage, plus the excess of boot recognized, which is going to be our excess of $5,000, which equals zero. It always is going to equal zero. 
Make sure I'm not missing anything. The, if the character of the gain, and we have to look at that by allocating the gain according to um, rel respective fair market values. So we have to do that. Um, some ways to avoid 357C. So if we want to avoid 357C, what are some ways that you can think of to get out of this problem? <clears throat> First of all, I guess I didn't mention this, but this is also done on an aggregate basis. So 357C is done on an aggregate basis. So if the shareholder is contributing two or three properties, we are going to basically look at it in aggregate for that shareholder. The same thing as um, the 362E, what we were looking at earlier. So, <clears throat> what are some ways that you could get around 357C? So the first possibility is to contribute more property or to contribute cash. Then what are we doing? We're basically increasing our aggregate basis to offset that aggregate liability. Um, another way that has been that's been done is by contributing a note created by the shareholder, so a promissory note. And there's a very famous case called Perocci, P-E-R-O-C-C-I. It's discussed on page 14, or it's actually P-E-R-A-C-C-H-I. And the code basically said that, it, not the code, the court case, Parachi, found that the contribution of, no, of a note was an acceptable way to get around 357C, basically. Um, because really the question is, if you contribute your own note, um, do you get basis for your own note that you are contributing? That's the question. Is it zero basis or do you get basis for your own promissory note? Parachi said you do get basis. There are other circuits out there that disagree with Parachi. So depending upon where you are, the courts might disagree on whether you get basis for your own note. And if you don't get basis for your own note, then contributing your own promissory note is not going to help you to get around 357C. Um, There is a little bit of a discussion in the lecture material on page 15 on the difference between recourse versus non-recourse liabilities. I would encourage you to take a look at that, read it in the lecture material, and read it in the book. It's not really discussed in a lot of detail, um, but you can take a look at it. Um, so a recourse liability is when you are also held personally liable if the debt is not paid. A non-recourse it means that if you don't pay, the lender's only recourse is to take the actual property underlying the debt. So take a look at you know that in the book, and we are going to do a problem. So I'm going to pause this and come right back. <clears throat> 